Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this November 18th, 2016 day in our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can catch my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's on First Amendment. That's Pacific Time. They also play the show at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. And if you can't get it there, go to my long-standing website, A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N.com, Arctic beacon.com and you can get shows going back over a decade regarding what I call the Vatican led new world order my show has also been called the alternative to the alternative media and uh, for good reason we delve into subjects that neither one of the alternative or the mainstream really want to talk about and I see over the years that uh, uh, it's harder and harder to get information on the internet. Social media is a monster, and uh, there's people out there performing hoaxes all the time. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've had to backtrack on stories. The one thing about it, folks, is got to check things out. Everybody will flip to a Google page, and all of a sudden that's gospel truth. It's not so. You got to check it out and do your research. And in a sense, social media. Uh, can backfire on a lot of people if you don't. Now, back in the old days, before the Internet, uh, I remember as a reporter, uh, one of the best uh, tools was to always verify things by talking to people. Yes, actually calling them up, trying to get a hold of them, uh, and then doing your homework. So, uh, just my little thoughts about that. Well, all week I've been talking about the Tony Alamo ministry and we've presented uh, four shows. I have three members on this week. And I wanted to dedicate this week to uh, a petition that I started called Free Tony Alamo. And uh, you can get that at freetonyalamo.com. If you go up or left, click on the petition tab, and you can go there, sign up, and uh, help hopefully get Tony out of prison. He's been there since 2008. And uh, like I said, check out the story. You can go to alamoministries.com. You go to my site. You can see uh, some people do YouTubes uh, every day on my show. So there's a YouTube out there on every show I've done. And uh, you can get a lot of information on my website going back over a decade. Uh, I think the first time I talked to Tony was 2005, four or five. So it's been a long time. And uh, I've gotten to know this story quite well. And I'm uh, culminating it with this petition and we're going to get a whole bunch of signatures there's a lot of great comments uh, that are on that petition page as well as the letters I get we're going to talk about a couple of those today uh, in the second half hour because I got some things to talk about here uh, the whole idea is to get this petition in the hands of people that can actually uh, get Tony out of prison. The only way we're going to do it is through a pardon, as the courts have really bungled this case and all of his appeals. Uh, basically, we're not, I bet you we're not even looked at. Uh, he has, uh, I, I've never seen a guy be railroaded like this. I mean, this the trial was a uh, kangaroo court. Then they kidnapped all, many of the members, uh, the children of the uh, members of his church saying there was child abuse when child abuse has never been found and then they started taking away all their property and uh, one judgment uh, in a civil court was the largest judgment in Arkansas state history of over 500 million so this is not a small case so what people ask me is well what are you going to do with this petition and who is going to look at it and I said this I said once Trump gets into office and gets his feet wet in January, uh, we're going to send it to the office of the pardon attorney who assists the president in the exercise of executive clemency. Now, under the Constitution, folks, the president's, uh, under the Constitution, the president's clemency power extends only to federal criminal offenses. The pardon attorney prepares the department recommendation to the president for final disposition of each application. Now, the reason that we can go to the uh, pardon attorney is that Tony was uh, wrongfully, I might add, convicted of the white slave 
Traffic Act or the Mann Act, and it's a, a federal law passed June 25th, 1910, uh, Chapter 395, 36 Statute 825, codified as amended at 18 U.S.C. 2421-2424. So uh, we're going to get this to him. Now, the application process is uh, long, and they provide that. We're going to have to follow the steps. And also what they require, well, they don't require, but uh, they want affidavits of Tony's character. So I've been now soliciting that and getting people that know him quite well to start thinking about uh, writing their character affidavit so that we can include it with the petition as well as a synopsis of this story so that the pardon attorney can easily uh, check it out. So that's the intention. Now, why wait till Trump gets into office? Well, there's two reasons. One, the Obama-Clinton cartel, and the Clinton cartel, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, were instrumental, like they were at Waco, in trying to frame Tony Alamo and remove him from the face of the earth, as well as his ministry. Now, one of his churches was in uh, Falk, Arkansas, where Bill Clinton, of course, we know, was the governor of Arkansas, etc. So we would have never had any opportunity if Hillary Clinton got in, and there was no chance with the Obama administration. However, there's a window here, an opportunity with Donald Trump, and the reason is, is he's been touting, uh, first of all, he was elected with the highest evangelical Catholic vote in, of, in history in modern times of, for president. And he... Uh, got that vote by saying he would like to see Christians not be persecuted. Uh, he's uh, admitted that Christians are being persecuted worldwide, as well as Christians that pastors here that have been muzzled by what is called the Johnson Amendment, and that is Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, passed a, got a bill passed that stated that if you want 501c3 money, tax-exempt status, pastors cannot, from the pulpit, support candidates or talk politics. Now, Trump said that's not fair. So I believe that we have a case here because Tony, you will see if you look at all the evidence, has been put in prison because of his outspokenness, his political views, as well as his uh, religious views, which basically are not rebellious. They're basically the same views of the Protestant reformers back during the time of the Protestant Reformation. Now, we tout ourselves as a Protestant country, right? A, a Christian country. But here, right before our very eyes, we see the most horrendous persecution of a ministry I've ever seen. It exists right here in America. That's why I believe we have a window of opportunity to maybe, and to hopefully, with a lot of prayers, get Tony out of prison. He's been there since 2008. He's 82 years old, he's legally blind, needs medical care, and he's been in long enough for crimes he hasn't committed. This church has a long history of persecution going back to the 60s. And during this week, we presented that through Bert Krantz, Greg Sego, and Deborah Andrasek yesterday. And we tried to encapsulate what's happened to this ministry in 40 years during this week. And uh, what I want to do is put all these five shows together and perhaps uh, package them and we can get people also to get interested listening and get, get the, uh, the story out there. Maybe even include them uh, when we send this to the president, the uh, pardon attorney, uh, to see if we can get Tony pardoned. Now, the one thing I wanted to mention, in the second half hour, I'm going to go over some things so you get an idea of what the ministry is like today. Some of the things, uh, I got a couple letters and things uh, from one letter from an inmate who's talking about what's, uh, what Tony's doing in prison, how he's, he's still uh, preaching the gospel and helping inmates, even uh, you know getting inmates to have pen pal people that with the ministry that are also helping some uh, you know with some necessary items that they need that they don't get when they're in prison like hygiene items etc so he's actively still uh, preaching the gospel behind bars 
So let's. Uh, uh, what I wanted to do first, though, was uh, many of you probably wonder uh, what is a what is a pres how does a president pardon? There are many. Uh, why does he do it? There are many controversial pardons that presidents do, and they always wait for the most controversial at the end of their presidency, and then never explain them. And my point is, if I'm going to go through some of these controversial pardons over the years, and if presidents can pardon these criminals, I see no reason why Donald Trump should allow Tony DeLamo to sit one more day in jail. He's an innocent man that's been persecuted because of his religious views. And if Trump is true to, true to his words... He wants to stop persecution of Christians worldwide. We know what's going on. With uh, he wants to stop ISIS and he wants to stop uh, the Caliphate from you know the Caliphate comes out openly and states they want to destroy Western civilization and kill any infidel that doesn't follow um, uh, Muhammad. Well, we can start out by one releasing Tony Olamo. He's being persecuted by his own people in our country. And that's not right. So I'm going to go over some of these controversial pardons, and I think you'll see what I mean. Before I do that, though, let me mention this. Uh, just yesterday, Reverend Jesse Jackson, when I say reverend, I put that in quotes, uh, Jesse Jackson came out publicly and stated that he believes that President Obama should give Hillary Clinton a preemptive pardon for any wrongdoing she may have done in the past and any uh, thing that she's been, you know, uh, anything possible, she's got nobody could ever touch her legally. Okay? A preemptive pardon. She hasn't even been convicted of anything. So that statement is quite interesting because I think Jesse Jackson is stating that he believes she's a criminal. Now, if Obama does pardon her, she's got to admit you know, that she, you know, why would she accept it? She can refuse it, and many have in the past. But if she admits to it, she's admitting to her crimes that everyone knows she's committed. One of the reasons why she's not in the White House today. She came on the other day. She gave a speech just the other day. It looked terrible, by the way. She looked like she aged 20 years from the time she looked so peppy. Uh, the day before the election when they were opening champagne bottles thinking they were going to win. And she said this, she said, after, after the election, I felt terrible and I just wanted to curl up with a good book or my dogs and never leave the house. Well, I think that's a good idea. Just never leave the house anymore. I don't need to listen to her. But if she gets pardoned and Tony Alamo sits in jail, and, there, and, and the president doesn't act on that. Just another example of how the criminals go free and the innocent are imprisoned. Let me get to some of these other controversial pardons. Okay, let me, let me start out right here. The first one I want to talk about uh, is, and in fact, I've even mentioned it on the petition, was the billionaire investor and commodities trader Mark Rich. I don't know if any of you remember him who uh, violated the embargo on Iran. He was pardoned on the last minute, the last day, by President Bill Clinton. The controversial pardon even came despite the fact. Now listen to this. It came when Rich fled to Switzerland and was on the FBI's most 10 most wanted list. Clinton issued about 450 pardons and commutations during his presidency. Now, well, who else did he pardon? He... Uh, wasn't the only controversial pardon issue issued by Clinton. Clinton also pardoned a dozen members of the nationalist terrorist group FALN, several of whom were expected to serve out their terms until death for horrendous charges. Incredible. These terrorists are going free, and Tony sits in prison. How about this one? This is a good one. Clinton's con this controversial Clinton pardon streak continued with former Representative Mel Reynolds of Illinois, who was convicted of corruption and statutory rape of a 16-year-old campaign volunteer. Convicted. 
not convicted of the Mann Act like Tony, which if you look at the history of the Mann Act, it's been used for political purposes in the past because you do not have to prove or have evidence of, a, uh, of sexual abuse or rape. Now here's a guy pardoned after solid evidence that he raped a 16-year-old girl. Clinton pardons him. Now how about our Arkansas Governor Mike Beebe? He won't be the first executive to pardon an immediate family member. Clinton pardoned his half-brother Roger Clinton, who was convicted of dealing cocaine on his last day in office. How about President Reagan's Secretary of Defense? secured a presidential pardon from President George H.W. Bush in 1992. Casper Weinberger had been indicted on perjury and obstruction of justice charges related to the Iran-Contra scandal. You know what I'm talking about, the arms into the hands of terrorists. He was one of several officials involved in the affair whom Bush pardoned. So it, it crosses party lines. Let's go way, way back. How about uh, all Vietnam era draft dodgers were unconditionally pardoned by President Jimmy Carter, identifying hundreds of thousands who evaded or attempt to evade the draft. The blanket pardon was one of Carter's top campaign promises. Okay. Now, some of you may say, well, the war was wrong, they were right. Now, here's the deal I don't know how many of you grew up through the Vietnam period, but I did. And I was up. I would have had a choice if my uh, and I would have not done what they did. I wanted I would have followed the law, even though I disagreed with the war. So this what I'm getting at here is a lot of people are talking about Tony Alamo and they look at all the press and all the things that have been written that are false about him. And I just do not like to see travesty, you know, people who actually commit crimes get pardoned why a man who hasn't committed anything and has been railroaded by the system sits in prison. That's why I think uh, this is such a huge case in this country. Now this also reminds me of, I'm just going to get off the subject here for a second, uh, it reminds me of the protests going on right now. And uh, Deborah Andrasek and I talked about this yesterday because it's, it's really important. Uh, these millennials, these kids, uh, I call them like snowflakes. A lot of people have been talking about that. This is an orchestrated effort. These people are, are basically, why, what are they protesting against? I remember the Vietnam protests. And, I, you know, I grew up, I went to school in a Midwestern school, Western Illinois. We didn't protest much there. We were more, we weren't like on the East or West Coast, uh, Kent State, things like that. More of a conservative area uh, school however I didn't I thought that the protests people have a right when you when you have a, a, a war like the Vietnam War people had the right to uh, protest right and there was a reason behind it now this pardon by Jimmy Carter I could look back and say you know uh, many of these people were were uh, basically behind or didn't go because the war was wrong, and they're right. I wanted to bring it up because I, I wanted to just show you how, uh, how you know, upside down sometimes our country is. So we have these, you know, during the Vietnam period, there was a valid reason for it. Now we have a, part, a protest over a president-elect. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, these protests are going to continue and continue. And uh, there is a reason behind it. And the reason, I think, is they want to flip some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the electors, the delegates, uh, the Electoral College, because uh, some states are bound by the Electoral College, you know, the electors have to uh, keep their, uh, their vote, depending if the state uh, votes for Trump. Others are free, and they have, I think, on December 6th, the Electoral College gets together and officially puts 306 uh, in Trump's category and 235 in Clinton's, 270 is needed. And uh, however, some can change their mind. So I think some of these people are trying to get them to flip, but that'll never happen. Uh, so really these kids, these college students, 
they want safe zones in their school. They want they've been some have been giving them teachers have been allowing them to walk out and protest and babying them like things I've never seen before. For what? One, you know, what they came out and said was we cannot. They are protesting Donald Trump's rhetoric. What he said some terrible things. And I'm sitting there going, what is going on here? What about protesting Hillary Clinton's crimes? How about Benghazi? Now, do you think if Clinton would have won that the hardworking Americans would be doing the same thing here that these uh, protesters are all over our country, many being paid by George Soros? No, of course not. So let's get back to these uh, presidential pardons. Okay, let's go back to the Carter period again. Uh, Jimmy Carter also used his presidential power to pardon a famed musician and activist, Peter Yarrow, who had been convicted of taking indecent liberties with a 14-year-old fan. Now, let's uh, move forward. This is going to be interesting when we look when we look at N Nixon. Nixon avoided being indicted in the Watergate scandal after his former vice president and successor, Gerald Ford, pardoned him for crimes he committed or may have committed. His pardon came about a month after he resigned from office in the wake of this huge scandal. Uh, let's go farther. Call it uh, good karma, but before Nixon got his own pardon, he pardoned several others, including infamous union leader Jimmy Hoffa. No, do you remember this? <laughs> in 1971, Hoffa had been convicted of jury tampering and fraud, but the pardon didn't keep him out of trouble, as Hoffa vanished in 1974, and his body has never been found. Oh, we got to talk about... Uh, well, let's uh, let's. I got a couple more here because I only have two minutes, and then we'll get back to the uh, Lamo ministry and some things I wanted to do in the second half hour. I've got a couple more here that you may have uh, may be interesting. How about Aslam B. P. Adam? He was a Pakistani drug trafficker who was convicted of conspiracy to possess and distribute one million worth of heroin. Adam served eight years of his 55-year prison term, but was uh, controversially pardoned by former President George H.W. Bush two days before he left office in 1993. The pardon came as a shock to everyone, but Bush never, ever gave an explanation for it. How about this one? I never realized this one. You know the Yankees. Remember old George Steinbrenner? In 1974, the longtime owner and managing partner of the New York Yankees was charged with 15, 14 criminal counts of obstruction of justice and conspiring to make illegal contributions to President Nixon's 72 re-election campaign. Uh, Steinbrenner was pardoned by Reagan for the election law case in which he was fined 15000 but never served jail time. The caveat was that Reagan required Steinbrenner to admit to the crime in order to receive the controversial pardon. Oh, there's a lot of these guys. Uh, <laughs> isn't that interesting? Oh, uh, I want to, what's this one here? Uh, Mark Felt and Edward Miller are known as the highest ranking convicted criminals in the FBI because of their involvement in the 1978 invasion of Vietnam protesters' homes and offices during the Nixon presidency. Uh, <laughs> these guys, uh, of course, were then uh, pardoned. Very interesting, huh? Uh, Ronald Reagan pardoned them, advised against it, and the former president pardoned Felton Miller for their criminal convictions. Reagan's reasoning for the pardon was that the men were acting on an honorable mission to protect the nation. Okay. We'll be back uh, in, th in three minutes on the investigative journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. 
If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we are back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this November 18th, 2016 day on our calendar. And uh, yes, we're wrapping up the week, uh, doing a week's worth of shows uh, regarding the persecution of the Alamo ministry and also uh, trying to get everything together so that we can present a, uh, a letter and a petition and a request to the pardon attorney of the President of the United States to release uh, Tony Alamo. And we're going to do that once Trump gets into office, have a better chance. This half hour, I just want to spend, uh, to close it up here, I want to get this included in this week's show because I want to package this whole week for a purpose. And uh, one of the things I noticed in the Alamo case was how the media was orchestrated. Trump always talks about the, the rigged media, the rigged system. Well, Mr. Trump, here's a perfect example of the rigged system working against a good Christian minister. So why don't you listen to this story? Now, the point I'm trying to make is, uh, not only was the trial worse than a kangaroo court, but the media was all alerted to this uh, raid that took place in 2008. And uh, we talked about that yesterday with Deborah, uh, Deborah Andrasek. And you can go back to many of my shows. We've discussed it uh, many, many times. But the media was alerted to this, and it was like the biggest story on the front page. You know, uh, they had it on ABC, NBC, CBS, 100 news outlets all over the country front paging this story as some cult was taken over and this, this wicked man was put in prison. How, you know, like Trump says, the media are the biggest bunch of liars that are living in this country today. What a group of, you know, 
what a ridiculous group trying to tell people how to live their lives and giving them stories like this. So uh, we have something in common with you, Mr. Trump, on this story. We agree with you regarding the media. And because of that, I wanted to play this, uh, it's, I think it's a six-minute clip that Bert Krantz put together to give you the true story of who these people are. Now today, there's, despite all the government's efforts to wipe them off the face of the earth, they're still getting three to 400,000 hits a week on their website or maybe even more. They're sending thousands of millions of pieces of literature all over the world. And I want to play the six-minute clip so you know what they really are about. And secondly, then I'm going to read you a letter uh, from an inmate regarding how Tony is helping people even while in prison. And then a couple comments and uh, things sent regarding the Alamo ministry from abroad, from people who have been helped by them. And I thought we could round out the show that way. So let me play this really quickly here. And this is Bert Krantz, who put this together. Uh, it's a mini peek inside the Alamo ministry. The purpose and mission of the Tony Alamo Christian Ministries is the Great Commission. To bring the gospel to the whole world, as Christ commanded. To feed the hungry, to visit the sick and imprisoned, and to offer help and hope to a lost and dying world. Our doctrine has always been and still is the Old and New Testament of the King James Version of the Bible, with no private interpretations. God's word means what it says. From his early years in the 1960s in Hollywood, pastors Tony and Susan Alamo formed the church and patterned it after the first Christian churches in the book of Acts. As it did then, our ministry still operates as a cooperative, interdependent body of believers, working together and supporting each other in our newfound salvation. All resources brought into the ministry are used to provide for the needs of the members, and everything above is used to spread the gospel throughout the world. As the ministry quickly grew, we labored in fields, hoeing cotton and working in vineyards and orchards to provide food, housing, clothing, transportation, and eventually TV broadcasts which featured our zealous choir and orchestra comprised of former hippies, drug addicts, and people from all walks of life, converted to Christianity and completely rehabilitated through our ministry. These programs also featured testimonies of new converts, won to the Lord by pastors Tony and Susan Alamo, and a message of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ by Susan Alamo. Our ministry is now worldwide, reaching across the United States and into many nations through radio, books, and Bibles, and the distribution of powerful gospel literature, either purchased or printed at our own facilities, staffed by our own skilled volunteer printers, who are in turn supported by the ministry. We also distribute audio messages duplicated at our own facilities. Many other needs, including finances, food, water wells and fresh water tanks, clothing, vehicles, and housing, to name a few, are regularly provided to ministries and individuals overseas. All materials we ship throughout the United States or overseas is free, including postage and handling. Our worldwide outreach serves thousands of pastors and evangelists, and they express their thanks in the many letters and emails we receive daily. A sampling of these letters is always printed in our gospel literature, which is translated into many languages. Our translation department works with United Nations translators and other professionals and volunteers to accomplish this. We maintain the Alamo Ministries website, through which we receive large volumes of requests for free gospel literature, Bibles, and other needs. Our website receives traffic from 55 to 70 countries per week. We also distribute literature by the millions, Bibles and audio gospel messages in major cities and small towns throughout the United States. On each piece of literature are the addresses of our locations, where worship services are held every night, 
and free, nutritious meals are carefully prepared and always provided at all of our locations. Also on each piece of literature is stated that we provide a place to live with all things necessary for life to those in our United States locations who truly want to serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We list our telephone line, answered seven days a week, around the clock, by ministry members, ready to answer questions, to pray with people, and to take their requests for literature, Bibles, and other assistance. It is for these and other ministerial purposes that we have pulled together to work for, buy, build, renovate, maintain, and pay utilities and taxes on our various properties. These are our homes, our apartments, our places of worship, our cafeterias, our schools, our gyms, and warehouses to care for our families and to carry out our missionary work. Every member of our ministry knows and understands that we are the owners and beneficiaries of these properties and all the resources and holdings of our ministry. We prepare the meals. We eat in our cafeterias. We worship at our gathering places, whether they be church structures, dining rooms, or in our homes. We work together so that we can reach out more effectively, visiting hospitals and nursing homes, providing food and other needs and supplies for needy families, delivering food by the truckload to missions, food kitchens, and disaster sites. We are Christian, law-abiding individuals who of our own free will have joined together as a church, a corporate body of believers, to do all we can for the Lord by working together to reach out to every soul we possibly can and share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, now just ask yourself, and I'm going to let you answer this question. Why would our government want to shut down all these good works? I'll let you answer that. I think I, I presented the reason many, many times in the past. Secondly, let's just make an analogy here. The issue of illegal immigration and uh, the caliphate, uh, Sharia courts, and all of uh, the terrorist groups that are being funded from within are allowed to function in this country to destroy Christianity. Why would you think the government of the United States would allow, now Trump says he's going to get rid of these people, but there's over two to three million illegal uh immigrants in this country who are dangerous, who have been tossed out numerous times fel uh, with felonies on their record, who have killed Americans, who have been put into custody but then allowed to go free. But the government has the audacity to put an innocent pastor in jail for 175 years while it allows two to three million of these criminals to walk our streets Ask Kate Steinle's family what they think about that and others who have been killed by these people that have been here illegally, known by the government, the states, the cities like Chicago, all these sanctuary cities, and allow, they just set them free and they will not allow or they have not enforced federal law to remove them. Now Trump says he wants to enforce federal law and remove these criminals. I think he should remove these criminals and also allow Tony, who's innocent, to be free. And that's my, my hope. Okay, so Tony sits in prison right now. And I promised I'd read you a, a letter. This was from an inmate uh, several years ago. Uh, and he said this, I'm an inmate and I was in Bowie County Jail with Pastor Tony at which time I had asked him for, for a pen pal, someone to write. And he hooked me up with Sanford and Terry, 
Uh, they have really been a blessing to me. Their letters, they have also had, uh, had the newsletter from the Alamo Ministry sent to me, and I enjoy it a lot, and it keeps me going every day. And so do many of the inmates here who have also read it. The reason I'm writing uh, reason I'm writing you at this time, well, in fact, there are a couple of reasons. San and Terry have told me to start sending you uh, things, and I've been uh, sending, to the, uh, sending them, and they've been helping me so I can have uh, the proper hygiene items that I can't get here, things uh, from the commissary that I can't afford. As I've, I've told them, God knows my needs and seems to always make sure they are met. They've really helped me out. Also, if you know about how Pastor Tony is doing now, please let me know. The last uh, that I had heard was that he had uh, had an attack and had been in, put in segregation. Also, they uh, that they had took uh, took his glasses away from him and the TV that he used to read his Bible with. As I have said, I enjoy the, your newsletter and the letters people send in, and I would like to share my meeting with Pastor Tony with you. And what, I, what an inspiration he was to myself and so many others that were locked away from the world. At, at the time, I was being housed in the Bowie County Jail awaiting trial. Before my trial, I was being held in the main population. We all had been seeing all the things that were going on in Pastor Tony and his ministries. There was all kinds of talk some, uh, about him in, in some way. As for myself, I really did not believe everything that they were saying about him. I know how our government is. But can we really say with a word, our government, some of the things that they do? After we had heard that he was being held down in segregation, the whole, I had a, had a great desire to, to meet him. He being there and me being on the main line, so to say, my getting to see him was not that easy. Okay, I'll, I'll get back. Okay, on January 21st, 2000, uh, back, in, back in 2009, I went to trial and was sentenced to 75 years, being 52 years old at the time, the end of the world, so to say, locked away in some Texas prison for the rest of my natural life is as close to the end of the world as you can get. Being I feel that we are in the end times even adds more, more to that feeling. When the trial ended and when someone is given that kind of time, they put you in chains right away, right there, so you can't ever get away, be free again. It's a feeling that is hard to really put into words, even now years later. Also, when you receive what is equal to a life sentence, as soon as you are back at the prison, they take you to segregation, the whole. As I entered into this area, the guards are helping me make my way to my new home, so to say. It was a dark tunnel that looked to be uh, 15 feet or so that ended at a cell that had a small window with a little door on the window uh, that they could close or open. But as I got a few feet from where I thought they were going to take me, the tunnel turned to the left. As a slow to stop, the guard started yelling and pushing me, Come on, get, get in there, get in there. Your cell is all the way down at the end. But before I could get turned, I see movement in the cell number 201, just ahead of me, just, just close to me. Just like a dark blur for some reason, not really I, uh, like a human, but more like a dark spirit, or maybe you could say like a shadow shadow. As they push me to the left, I see a long hallway still, more like a dark tunnel. I really cannot see the end of it so dark at the end. Come on, move it. You're all, you're all the way to the end. We have a place for people like you. I can see more. Uh, he's talking here. This man's talking about this getting to his uh, hole, getting to his cell in this deep, dark tunnel uh, away from the main population. 
I can see, he goes on and he says, I can see more cells, or should I say more of the little doors that cover the small windows on the cell doors. Like I said before, it's very dark in the hallway, but about halfway down the hall, there's a light. The light is more like a glow than a light, so to say, like a feeling or a warmth in this so-called dark place, my new world of the lost souls. As I pass by the cells, some, some to the right, some to the left, the doors and the windows are open. As, bef as like blurs or shadow people are coming to see who it is they are bring they or who are who is there. My chains are very loud, and are echoing in the hallway. My freedom taken away for life. I really wanted to die right there, but when I made it to the the hall halfway point, there was this uh, light shining, and I looked into cell 204, and there he sat, this little old man with these coke bottle thick glasses with his face as close as he could get to the TV. But there was no picture, just words, big words on the TV. And there seemed to be something like I had never seen before, this uh, glow of a man looking, uh, looking at this TV. But then even more than that, a feeling of love came from him. He hears my chains, and he jumps up and hurries to the door so he can see me. He says not to be afraid of God is here, and he that God still loves me. As the guards push me on to the last cell on the right, number 208, I ask, who was that? And they said, this is uh, that was Alamo. He's not going anywhere, just like you. At that moment in time, a feeling of peace came over me, a feeling like no other I had felt before. That could have only come from God. What inspiration I received from him that dark night may be the darkest day of my life with just a few words that he said please send him my love and my thanks and tell him i miss our talks he talked to me all the time also thanks for the bible that brings peace to my soul i hope this will be a comfort to one and all i am a witness even though pastor tony may be in darkness he still holds the light the warmth that glows with all my love charles land p.s if there's anyone there at the church that would like to to come become a pen pal, maybe a lady or a man, it doesn't matter, that could use a friend, uh, I really would appreciate it. So there's just a, a short letter, and there's many more uh, notes that I've got from people that Tony has inspired while he's been in prison, and people have commented about it on my show. But, you know, it is time for him to... Uh, <laughs> to get out and that's what we're trying to do with all these week shows putting this petition together and then presenting it to the pardon attorney for the president of the united states once trump gets in and hopefully i think we're going to be successful i think we're going to win this so like trump says you know he's a winner we're going to win this one as well so stick with me we got about five minutes i wanted to read a few things a few uh, there's so many you got to go to that petition site there's many comments and don't be afraid to sign it I know a few people have emailed me and said, will I get put on some kind of list where the government will attack me? And I said, no. And what, what can they do to you? Would you rather, you know, if you don't, you're living in a prison anyway, aren't you? And that's what I always tell people. You know what? Don't be afraid of them. Speak out because if they fill you with fear, you're in a prison anyway. You're in a walking prison. Just allow yourself the courage you know to help somebody here and please uh, sign it if you and don't have second thoughts about what could happen nothing's going to happen i mean look at i'm still around and i've been one of the more vocal people in this country regarding the vatican led new world order so remember that okay i have about uh, four minutes here. What I wanted to do, a couple, you know, as I said, I've gotten responses and uh, notes uh, on the petition. People write their comments, go there and read some of them. They're really inspiring from all over the world. Uh, here's one that was sent to the Alamo Ministries that was sent to me, and this is from Uganda. It says, to Tony Alamo Ministries, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I really give glory to God for the work you're doing in our generation. For sure, your ministry here remains incomparable. However, it has not remained without a challenge. One day, a Roman Catholic priest openly declared a war on the literature and all those who distribute it. He spoke this through the radio waves. 
However, my purpose of writing to you is that you may send me a Bible to read, and if possible, also gospel literature uh, for dis distribution. Thanks, kind regards. Pastor, uh, boy, I can't pronounce his name. His first now, just say T. Gideon. Okay, this was translated from Portuguese and uh, sent to the Alamo ministry. Dear Brother Alamo, peace in Christ our Savior. Having received your newsletter, after reading and rereading your writings in the condition of Christianity, Catholicism engaged in the community here in a small town where I live, I feel a deep desire that troubles me and makes me write to you. I live in a region where Catholicism is dictates all the rules. As I said, I'm still in the Catholic Church, but I question myself very much about some of their practices and teachings. I ask you to understand my situation and help me to understand the holy will of God for my life. I know that God has plans for my life and ministry. This is why uh, why I would like to know your church better and study your teachings. I await your contact, uh, Gilmore Santos. That's from Brazil. Wow. That's a good one. Let me see how much time I have here, if I can squeeze one more in. I think I can. i got a minute and a half. Come on, speak quickly, Greg. Go on. Come on. As a distributor of your literature, I have observed a lot of miraculous ways in which God directs the distribution process. Many pieces of your literature have gone to different kinds of people, and the eyes of many are getting open. People have been declaring the power contained in your literature. The truth is being revealed to many. Your literature strengthens me so much. So many idol worshipers come to know Christ through your literature. It's my pleasure to contact you in regards to your ministry. I would like to thank you in advance for your prompt response to my letter. I don't have enough words to define my gratitude, but the omnipresent Lord is witness how much you inspired, uh, your inspired literature has done both in my life and in the lives of those whom the literature was distributed. Whenever the, wherever the Lord gave me the chance and time, the literature could be dis distrib uh, distributed in the student hostels, and in buses, sometimes when I'm on a trip in the streets, in the marketplaces, etc. Pray for my work, and that's from India. Yes. India. All right. So I squeezed. Yeah, I got that in. And how much time do I got? I got about 20 seconds. So anyway, go to freetonyalamo.com. Uh, read uh, on there. You'll see a number of different articles. One, you, you'll read an article there. You can go down and click on it regarding the FBI agents who came forward and signed affidavits that they were they were told to frame Tony Alamo. They were never allowed to testify in court. And there's an article written by a gentleman by the name of Robbie who stated uh, 10 ways you can help Tony. You can help him by signing this petition and following our shows and spread it around as far as you can. Okay, have a good weekend. I'll see you back here on the Investigative Journal on Monday. Good night. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book the rapture will be canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org.